to everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Andy Purvis. I am Director of Sustainable Manufacturing at the World Steel Association, and I'm delighted to be your host today at the latest of a, a series of webinars that we're co-organizing with 3M around the subjects of this year's Steel Safety Day and one of our key safety focuses from the year work at height. We have talked about many topics so far this year from fall arrest, mobile work platforms, temporary access. And today we are looking at an issue that I think presents one of our most serious safety risks across our industry, which is access to roofs and buildings. Working on buildings, facilities and roofs presents many working at height hazards, including suitable access, slippery and fragile old surfaces, but also external factors like weather conditions, material handling, leading edges, and rescue requirements. So our session today will look at these hazards in detail. Hopefully, we will help you understand some of the risks and consequences of these activities, and we will explore the planning required and the options, equipments, and solutions which are available to you to mitigate them. If we can move to the next slide, I will introduce our expert presenter for today. Our expert presenter is um, Dave Barker, Baker, sorry, who you may have come across. I think you've been involved in a few of these presentations before, Dave. Um, Absolutely. Dave's worked in the Dave's worked in the fall protection industry for over 20 years, including roles in fall protection systems design, fall protection training, um, project management, business ownership. And since he's been at 3M, he's held several roles, including a special projects manager, fall protection specialist. And at the moment, he's leading a team of application engineering specialists in the European Middle East region for fall protection. And these are responsible, this team for providing, you know, technical support for customers, product training, et cetera. Dave, we are delighted to have you with us today. Um, and I will hand over to you. So thank you very much. Many thanks, Andy. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. And um, thank you again to uh, World Steel for giving us this platform and being, uh, giving us the opportunity to talk to your members. It's, uh, it's a very great pleasure to be here. Um, so, yeah, as you mentioned, um, we are uh, talking about buildings, facilities and, and roofs uh, in this talk. So a lot of slides to get through. So uh, without further ado, I will uh, kick this straight off. Um, as usual, um, just one thing. We'll start with a disclaimer, um, which I will just read through briefly. So this presentation provides a general overview of full protection information and includes various 3M safety solutions. This webinar content should not be relied upon to make specific fall protection equipment selection, use and maintenance choices. Local country or regional regulations and guidance varies and the responsibility for the correct implementation of a fall protection program in compliance with local country or regional regulations lies with the employer. This presentation should not be relied upon um, in isolation. The content is accompanied by additional and or clarifying information. So thank you for that. Um, just Dave, what, uh, I, sorry, what I, I didn't mention, say, yeah, just sorry, what questions. I didn't say was the questions. Yeah, you can <laughs> yeah. You take that. Okay, no worries. Yeah, thank you for, uh, I, you and I remembered at the same point. So if there are any questions um, that you do have, uh, there, is, uh, there is either the chat function or the Q&A function. I think it would be preferable if you have questions, if you could put them in the Q&A because we are actually then able to answer the Q&A questions or we're able to save those after the webinar has finished. And we can always try and answer them afterwards um, rather than the chat function, which disappears at the end of the webinar. So if you do have any questions, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, and uh, I will try and answer some at the end if we have time. If we don't, then I will uh, I will take time to respond. So um, please, yeah, drop your your details in there as well. Because if I don't get the chance to respond, I will try and respond uh, via email. Okay. So uh, contents. We're going to um, just have a look at the the the, the concept, the, the buildings, facilities, and roofs, and, and and understand and clarify what we're talking about here. We're going to look at why roof access is required. The sort of tasks that 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 uh, that are carried out 
Um, and as Andy said, you know, perhaps one of the biggest areas with the most variables, I think, and, and we'll, we'll see that in the, in the upcoming slides. We're going to talk a little bit about the considerations of how we get onto the roof, accessing the roof itself uh, and, the, and the buildings and the facilities. Um, we're going to have a look at the hazards um, that are associated. We're going to focus primarily on, on roof hazards, but you know, these are relevant all across um, the buildings and facilities. Um, and the bulk of this webinar will focus on roofs because a lot of the a lot of accessing areas um, on buildings and facilities is duplicated internally with equipment and 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 um, as much as it is externally with buildings and facilities. So, but roofs are a particular unique uh, access that we really want to highlight uh, the hazards on those. We'll have then have a look at. Uh, some solutions from the, some of the options available um, in terms of roof access solutions. And then we're gonna focus perhaps on the main one for roofs, which is um, horizontal lifelines. They're often called permanent horizontal lifelines. They can be used temporarily, but these are, these are lifelines that are fixed onto roofs. We'll have a look at the options available to us there. Um, and also some of the design considerations on those. We'll then have a quick recap um, and any questions at the end. Okay, so, as we can see, these are a couple of, of images actually from the, the, the World Steel Association, um, uh, from uh, their library, which just shows the, um, this image and the next image really just shows the massive breadth of, of buildings and facilities um, that are, uh, that exist um, on, on a steel plant. You know, you've got everything from, from flat roofs, perhaps almost on temporary buildings in, in the foreground here, um, onto large industrial roofs, um, multi-level, some flat, some pitched. So you can see there's, you know, there's just a huge range of, of buildings um, and a massive surface area um, of potential access requirements. Similarly here, you can, you can see, you know, a, a, a massive range, very, very, you know, due to the nature of the way um, plants are, often long production lines. So you have very, very long, um, either flat or, or low pitched roofs, um, which require access. So you can just see that there's a huge scope for building and facility access within the steel industry, a, a huge footprint with an awful lot of, uh, of roof types that require access. So let's have a look and, and understand, you know, why might we want to go um, onto a roof? Well, we can need to go onto roofs for a number of reasons. One uh, is to is for general roof inspection, particularly um, if you've had uh, new building um, or new roofs put on. Um, a lot of the warranties around roofs will require regular inspection of those roofs, so there can be a need to get up there and inspect roofs as part of a maintenance plan or for warranty purposes. Gutter cleaning, you know. Um, Maintaining good, um, clean gutters stops water ingress problems. Obviously, you know, particularly important to the steel industry with um, issues of water getting into buildings. Um, so, you know, gutter cleaning um, and gutter maintenance. Also, nearly all of the uh, the ventilation um, is going to go up through uh, roofs. So, you're going to have things like um, you're also going to have things like the the fire. Um, things like smoke vents for fire. You're going to have ventilation up there, so you may need to get up there and replace filters um, or um, or ducting. Um, depending on the environment, you may also need to carry out roof cleaning, um, particularly if you have a lot of dust or, or debris that's coming out of vents that may build up on roofs. It may be necessary to, to carry out cleaning of those. Um, and equally, as again, there's going to be a lot of um, air handling or extraction. And it may well be that things like ducts and, and uh, equipment up there needs cleaning. So there's an awful lot of reasons for, for routine maintenance um, to go up onto roofs. In addition to that, there may well be need to replace or upgrade things. So it may be that sections of roof um, need replacing. Um, it may well be that you bring in specialist external contractors, or it may be if just small sections of roofs that need repairing or, or re um, replacing it is done internally. You may have new equipment being installed that requires additional vents or ducts uh, to be put through the roof, to be going up through the roof. Uh, roof lights um, can need re uh, replacement. 
um, indeed air handling equipment, um, or perhaps roofs need recovering. So rather than lit taking the roof up and replacing it, it might be that you're looking to recover it either with a painted uh, system or a, an overlay type system. So there's, re there's requirements for maintenance, um, there's requirements for replacement and upgrade to be going on the roof. And then of course, there's the issue of any emergency repairs that need to be carried out as well. So any, any emergency type repairs. So for example, if there's a roof leak, uh, if gutters or outlets um, block, um, uh, even outside of routine maintenance, there could be something that's um, fallen into a gutter and, and blocked an outlet. So it might need emergency access to, to uh, remove that. If air handling or, or fans or ducting breaks down, then they're outside of routine maintenance and there will be a need to, to get on the roof and, um, and maintain that or, or any of the chimneys or anything like that. So you can see there's a whole host of reasons why we would need to get on top of the facilities and carry out either routine maintenance, um, repairs, um, et cetera. And it's a, a huge and, and varied topic. So the first thing we need to think about is, well, how are we actually gonna get on the roof itself? You'll, you'll recall in one of the earlier webinars that we gave around cherry pickers and mutes, depending on where you are in the world, um, sometimes it, it can be that, that cherry pickers and mutes can be used to access roofing. Um, in certain places, it's not recommended. In others, it's allowable. Um, there are, for example, options with um, scissor lifts, um, such as top right shown, you know, scissor lifts have a, a, some sections where you can raise them up to roof level and then the platform itself actually slides and projects out over the roof to allow access. Could be that sometimes um, that cherry pickers can be taken up and landed in board of a roof. Um, also can be very um, handy if you're having to take equipment to roof uh, to a roof as well. Uh, worth bearing in mind though that um, if you do have a lot of equipment to take to a roof um, it can often be required that you set up uh, additional measures for taking that equipment to the roof such as crane uh, or perhaps equipment lifts rather than taking it up what would ordinarily be used for personnel access small hand tools small amounts of equipment they can be carried in bags or, or safely in cherry pickers and mutes can be taken up but if you have large amounts of equipment, it can often be necessary to set up separate material handling access onto a roof. Could be via access ladders. We've already had a webinar on, um, on, on access ladders. Could be via um, fixed access ladders externally on the side of buildings uh, or internally up through access hatches. Um, again, we've already had a, 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 um, uh, webinars on the, on the safe use of, uh, of ladders and the requirements that, that are needed there. So I won't go into that further, but you know, obviously if you're going up ladders, it's gonna be quite difficult to take equipment. And some roofs have access via internal stairs up onto, uh, um, that you'll have a, a, an opening that comes up onto the roof um, that allows access up via stairs. So you need to consider how we're gonna get our people up onto the roof um, and also then how we're going to get all of our equipment up onto the roof. So we need to give due consideration to that. So once we've thought about why we need to go on the roof and, and how we're gonna get people up there safely, we need to start to consider what the hazards are when we're up there. And, and there really are a very, very large number um, of hazards. The first obvious hazard is the roof edge itself. Um, for a number of reasons. Obviously, you know, the roof edge presents a fall risk. If you can fall off the edge of a roof, um, then it's a fall risk. So we need to be aware, um, is what we're doing, uh, gonna, are we going to be coming into close proximity um, of a roof edge? And again, depending on where you are in the world, depends very much on what the rules are. Some allow work within a certain uh, distance of, a, of an edge. Others give guidance. Um, but ultimately, you know, if, if you're working near an edge or, the, or you're accessing near an edge or there's a possibility that you could um, walk uh, past or that could include the possibility that you might walk off an edge, then it's important that we know where they are in relation to where we're accessing and the work that we're doing. Um, because obviously they prevent a fall hazard. One of the other big things to think about as well is that if we are using fall protection equipment, 
um, and we're working in fall arrest, you'll, you'll recall the principle of working in restraint or arrest. If we're working in fall arrest, then it's important the equipment that we're using is suitable for falling over an edge. OK, so it's what we call edge rated. OK, so very, very important um, that we consider that as well. Other things that we should, and perhaps this is um, one um, which is, is massively overlooked, is, is fragile surfaces. Um, fragile surfaces, very, very much uh, one of the biggest fragile surfaces that you'll see on roofs and that I've highlighted here is roof lights. Um, it is often very difficult to know whether or not um, a roof light is what can be termed walk safe or, or tread safe. Personally, I would always consider roof lights to be fragile unless I have absolute knowledge that they are not. Um, and even some of the ones that are considered to be walk safe, if they are particularly old um, and have spent an awful lot of time being um, subject of UV light um, and weather conditions, I would still consider them to be fragile surfaces. So we really need to be aware of uh, fragile surfaces, particularly um, when it comes to roof lights. Roof lights can often be very, very difficult to see. If the sun is shining on a roof in a particular way, it can be very, very difficult to make out where the roof lights are. Another thing that can happen is that if a roof has been painted over, um, I've also seen roof lights that have then been covered with a waterproof paint so that actually from the top, the whole roof surface looks the same. Um, and you don't know that underneath there is a fragile surface. So it's always important to identify whether the roof uh, has got fragile surfaces on it, particularly with roof lights, make sure that everybody's well aware of those, that they know where they are and that they're suitably protected. We'll have a look and, and discuss some of the solutions for, for roof light protection later on. Um, but roof lights are a, a very big reason why people fall through roofs. Another thing can actually be the roof surface itself, um, particularly if you've got very old roofs. Some very, very old roofs um, can be made out of uh, sort of asbestos type roof sheets or cementitious uh, fiberboard roofs. And in fact, the whole roof surface itself is not structurally safe to walk on. Um, so you need to understand actually, you know, is that a metal roof and is it safe for me to walk on? Um, or in fact, is the whole roof surface itself fragile? Because if you step onto these roofs away from purlin lines or, or structural supports, then you risk actually falling through the whole roof structure itself. So it isn't just um, roof lights, it can actually be the whole roof structure itself. So we really need to completely fully understand is that roof structure capable um, of being walked on before we decide whether or not we're going to access? Because an awful lot of old buildings um, are, have roofs on which the whole structure itself would be considered fragile rather than just roof light. So we need to identify, is that roof structure itself sound for me to be able to walk on? North lights, another type of roof light. Um, these are roof lights that you wouldn't walk over um, because they are either sort of vertical or, or inclined within the roof. And you can see I've put a couple of examples here. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily walk over these because they're they're not that they're quite steep pitched. They're not sort of part of what I would call the walking surface. But we need to give due consideration: are these fragile surfaces? You know, if you trip um, and fall into one. Is there a risk that you're going to fall through it and then obviously be exposed to a big fall risk the other side? If you lean against it, um, is it a fragile surface? Are you go, do you risk potentially going through that north light and being exposed to a fall hazard? So even though potentially it's not on what I'd call the walking surface of the roof, we also need to give consideration. And this, this came up with um, actually when we did the uh, meeting in Brussels with the World Steel Association members, um, this actually came up as a, a potential issue um, uh, in that was, was, you know, how do we protect North Lights? So we need to think about um, there and we can talk about again in a little bit later, we'll look at some of the potential solutions that we can offer here as well. And finally, 
What about unknown services? Another um, picture here, courtesy of the World Steel Association's um, library of, of pictures. You know, what do we do when we have perhaps uh, a glass roof like this? Um, what do we do about accessing that? Um, how do we go about it? How do we make sure that that's strong enough? You know, we need to we need to be aware that if we're going to walk on a roof, um, is that structure strong enough? Many glass roofs um, are capable of being walked on. You know, a, um, a lot of modern glass structures um, can take very, very big loads and are designed and in fact have uh, access systems designed onto them. But we need to make sure and understand, is the structure that we're walking on um, safe to do so? Okay, so there, there, there might be some, as I say, there might be sort of glass roofs or um, perhaps sometimes you see in, um, one of the things you see in airports, perhaps less so within, within steel industry, but you see these sort of inflatable roofs as well, um, perhaps over atrium areas. So we need to understand if, we, if we're not sure, we need to absolutely clarify before we send anybody out there to walk on the, the roof structure. So we've had a look there at sort of fragile surfaces and, and the, 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 the structure upon which we're walking. What about some other hazards that uh, are gonna be um, prevalent on roofs? Um, the weather, you know, um, we need to be particularly conscious if uh, the roof surface gets wet, okay? Uh, many roofs such as um, single ply membranes um, or sort of PVC roofs, um, or in fact, some metal roofs, when they get wet, will become very, very slippery. In fact, they'll become like an ice rink. Um, okay, so we, if we, we need to plan weather into our, uh, um, into our method statements and risk assessments and how we're going to deal with that. Um, wet weather can make some roofs extremely slippery. And if you are on a slight pitched roof, or if you are on a pitched roof, then obviously wet weather um, can be an, uh, a particular extra hazard because it can turn a pitched roof into a slide. So whilst you might be able to comfortably stand on the pitch, if it's wet um, and you fall and you start to slide down the roof and the roof is wet, then it may well be that you don't stop until you reach the edge. So we really need to be conscious of what kind of weather are we expecting. If we're expecting rain and we're expecting that surface to get wet, then we need to give due consideration to that. The heat and the sun, um, anybody in the UK at the moment will be um, used to experiencing um, some very, very hot weather, can cause a number of problems on a roof. Um, a lot of roofs, uh, the surface itself will get very, very hot. Um, so there's risk of potentially burning if you touch that roof. Um, so we can get some, some very, very hot metal roofs. Um, that roof also reflecting all of the heat with as insulation uh, values increase on buildings, a lot of that heat is reflected back. So the surface of that can get very, very hot in terms of radiated heat. So you can end up with dehydration. Obviously, uh, spending long times out in the sun, exposure to UV um, uh, can have serious consequences. And also, um, you can have problems with eyewear, uh, with eyes as well on uh, particularly some roofs which are sort of almost raw finish. So sort of um, aluminium, raw aluminium style finished roofs can reflect um, an, the, the sun and create a very, very bright um, environment which can be quite damaging to the eyes. It can also make it very, very difficult to see hazards as well. So we were talking about it being difficult to see roof lights earlier. Um, if you've got very, very bright um, sun, um, then that can be a particular hazard on roofs. So again, something that we really need to be aware of um, and pay attention to. Um, and it may well be that we need to limit the amount of time we spend on roofs, perhaps share time on the roofs between different crews, build in some shade, um, plenty of drinks breaks, um, sun factor, um, protective clothing and eyewear um, to factor in heat in the sun. It can get very, very hot. Um, up on top of roofs. Equally, the exact opposite, cold and ice. Um, when it gets very, very cold on roofs, uh, if you've got um, any kind of standing water, so if you end up with some dew on the roof in the morning, uh, or perhaps it's rained overnight and then the temperature has dropped, you can end up with frozen um, water on top of the roof covering. Okay, which creates effectively can create an ice rink on the roof. Again, 
very, very dangerous in terms of, of slips, trips and, um, and falls on level roofs and potentially lethal on pitched roofs um, if there's any kind of ice. So we really need to be very, very cautious um, if we're experiencing very, very cold weather, particularly cold weather that's dropping into freezing, even when um, you've come back up into positive temperatures. I've been on a lot of roofs where it's positive temperature in the day but overnight it's been frozen and you will have an area of roof that's been in the shade and still by lunchtime you can have ice in the area of shade so you can walk around from an area that's been in the sun all of the ice has thawed but if you walk around to an area that's been in the shade it can still have ice formed on that roof and then both on flat roofs and on pitched roofs you know um, ice can be a, a real hazard um, when you're up on that roof Wind speed, um, you know, uh, anybody who's been up a, a, a tall building will know that, you know, if you're down at a ground level, you can feel like there's there's very little wind at all. And as you move higher up, the wind speed um, increases and increases. So if you're on top of quite a tall building, there can be quite a noticeable breeze up there. Whereas at ground level, you quite possibly wouldn't be experiencing um, any real breeze at all or any wind at all. So. Wind can be a real particular hazard um, when up on roofs for a number of reasons, not just on you as a person. So if, if you're uh, near a roof edge or near a fragile uh, roof light and there's a strong gust of wind that blows you, can cause you to, to, to lose your balance or to step back, potentially step off an edge or, or onto a fragile surface. But we also have to give consideration to wind when we're talking about handling materials as well. Uh, if you are handling sheet materials, so in the form of uh, maybe insulation or ply or perhaps a large filter to go in um, so, uh, in some air handling equipment, if you're holding that um, and a gust of wind catches that, then you're effectively holding on to a sail. Um, and there are numerous cases of people when the wind has caught what they're holding on to, their natural reaction is to grip tighter. They don't want to let go because they, they don't want to let go of what they've got. Um, and so they hold on even tighter. Um, and there is a lot of cases of people that have been blown off roofs holding on to uh, the uh, piece of equipment that's created a sail. So we really need to factor in um, how strong that wind can get. Um, and just because it's, as I say, just because it's calm at ground level, it doesn't mean that there isn't going to be significant wind um, when you're up on the roof. Obviously, there's various devices that can be used. You could, you know, there, there's, a, um, there's wind socks or there's, there's handheld um, wind speed measuring devices that you can use to establish. And in certain places, in certain parts of the world, there will be um, limits as to what is safe. Um, but it's certainly something that needs to be factored in when working on, on buildings and facilities is that, you know, wind speed and as we go up, wind speed increases and that can have a significant impact on those working on the roofs. What else do we need to consider? Well, we need to consider the possibility of lightning strikes um, or, you know, really what I would include in here sort of really inclement weather. Um, you know, if you are up on a roof, then it's quite possible that you might be the tallest um, thing in the area. Uh, so if there is lightning storms, if there are thunderstorms around, working on top of roofing um, is certainly not something that should be carried out when there's a possibility that there could be lightning strikes. So you, depending on where you are in the world, if there are thunderstorms forecast or, or prevalent, then really, you know, that's something that we should be taking into account um, and we shouldn't be going up onto roofs when there is that possibility. Um, even if you've got alternative arrangements for, for lightning strikes, if there is, you know, if there is lightning in the area, you don't want to be exposed, stood up on a roof, um, acting as the potential lightning rod. So we really need to be aware of, you know, what is the weather likely to do? And how long is the task that we're going to be doing? You know, is it, if it's a, a long task that might last all day and there's bad weather, it might be fine in the morning, but there might be bad weather coming in in the afternoon. We need to factor that into our planning and think about it and say, okay, we need to have somebody keeping an eye on the weather. Is it going to turn very windy? Uh, is it going to rain? Or, or perhaps is there going to be a thunderstorm coming through that might um, bring about um, a lightning strike? 
So a lot of weather conditions that we really need to take into account, heat, light, uh, heat and light and sun, cold, rain, uh, wind speed, lightning, uh, or, or really inclement weather, um, extreme weather conditions, all things that we need to take into consideration when we're looking at going on top of buildings and facilities. Another one can be um, hazards caused by the, the actual uh, the plant or the, the area itself. So perhaps if you're working close to um, uh, extraction discharge, it may well be that you need to shut down certain pieces of equipment if you are working on a roof in and around that area. You don't particularly want nasty chemicals or extreme amounts of dust um, being discharged from an extraction if you're working on the roof. Um, partly because obviously it could be very, that could be very bad for your health long term, but equally it could cause you to um, uh, become distracted or perhaps uh, incapacitated and fall. You may even, you might fall through a fragile surface or you might fall off the edge of a roof or you might actually just become incapacitated on the roof and, and need rescuing. So we need to give consideration to, is there anything chemicals or dust um, um, that is gonna be discharged at roof level um, that could affect those working on buildings and facilities. So it may mean that we need to lock out and tag out certain parts um, so that people can safely operate in an area without that risk of being engulfed um, as part of an extraction discharge. Another thing that we have to consider is actually the, the pitch of the roof itself. You know, is it safe to actually be walking around on that pitch, uh, on that roof. Now, when we talk about roof pitch, you know, a sort of, I would, I generally tend to describe something nominally flat as sort of naught to five degrees of, of roof pitch would be something that I would consider to be sort of nominally a flat roof. Beyond that, once you get up to about 10 degrees, beyond 10 degrees, I'll be honest with you, walking on a roof, uh, a pitched roof is extremely hazardous. Um, and it's likely that you're not going to be able to do that without something helping you to stay on the roof. So some form of work positioning system. So not restraint, but actually work positioning. So very similar to being on a ladder and using a work positioning system to hold you on that ladder so that you can work with your hands. If the roof pitch is, is sort of much beyond 12 to 15 degrees, you are likely to be relying on something to keep you on that roof. Really, at that point, you're into specialist roof access, almost a cross between roof access and abseiling. It's not full abseiling because you're not hanging in the rope, but it's likely that you're going to be into work positioning and you're going to be using something to hold you on that roof. Some other things that could be worth considering in, the, in that circumstance would be uh, walkways, uh, a walkway to level out that roof. Um, but really, if the roof pitch is getting beyond 10 degrees, you really ought to be asking ourselves the question, should we be sending somebody out there to safely walk on that roof? Um, because the realistic um, outcome is if they slip, um, there's a very real chance that they're going to carry on sliding and potentially go over the edge or perhaps hit a fragile roof surface. So we really need to understand the roof pitch that we're working on. Uh, is it safe to do so? Can we safely access that without additional measures, walkway or, or work uh, positioning system? And the final one that we always need to still consider is, is the dropped objects. You know, um, if, if we're working up on a roof, particularly a pitched roof, if, if you drop something, um, there's a very real likelihood that that tool is, is going to slide down the roof. And if it gets to the edge, it could just drop off that the, the edge of the roof and potentially hit people working below or walking below. So if we are working um, overhead, then it's important that either we uh, use demarcation area um, to keep a safe area below, or that we use uh, tool tethering uh, or fall protection for tools so that any tools or equipment that we drop doesn't risk rolling down a roof um, and falling off the edge. And that counts for both the, the tools and equipment, you know, something even as simple as a, a nut and bolt. If, if you're working, you know, 20 or 30 meters up in the air and you drop a, a, a nut um, as part of assembling some duct work and you're on a slight pitched or maybe a barrel vaulted roof, if that, if that nut starts to roll down and drops off, by the time it hits somebody at, at ground level, it's gonna be going a significant speed and do a significant amount of damage. 
Okay, so we really need to give a lot of consideration to dropped objects. Okay, so we've had a look then at the hazards that we need to take into consideration when we're looking at accessing facilities and um, buildings, facilities and, and roofs, particularly externally on roofs. What we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at some of the measures um, that we can take to uh, avoid those risks and that we can put in place to control them. And then we're going to focus on, on more of the, the personal ones, um, the solutions, particularly around horizontal lifelines. So we're all aware of the hierarchy of control. What can we look at in, in terms of some of these to con for controlling facilities? access risks well we can look to use the workplace itself um, so if there are suitable height parapets that we can stand behind uh, then we can um, you know some roofs can be designed with these in not very helpful if you've got existing facilities but you know if there are uh, existing parapets um, or perhaps if there's modifications being done it can be advisable and, and access is needed it can be advisable to build in um, existing protection into the workplace. Of course, alternatively, we, you know, if, if we're thinking that maintenance is going to be required, perhaps very frequently and perhaps by larger numbers of people, remembering that things like PPE is, is probably best suited really for smaller, lower numbers. If you think that there's a, uh, a chance that we're going to have to put lots of people up there, um, perhaps for very, very frequent maintenance, it may well be necessary to install handrail, could be installed, could be freestanding, which sits on the roof, like a counterweight handrail, or it could be permanent fixed to the roof handrail. But that can offer a, a, a solution uh, to accessing the roof area, such that obviously, as it's described, it's collective, once you've installed it, that the user doesn't have to do anything. It's a passive form of protection. That roof uh, edge protection just sits there. Um, and then, then you know that anybody that you send up there, whether you're sending one or 20 people up there, is protected. If it's perhaps some uh, not routine maintenance, but perhaps some repairs, it may be necessary to look to build scaffolding. So it may be necessary to build temporary scaffolding um, either on the roof structure itself or perhaps around the edge of the roof structure, both in terms of providing safe access, in terms of providing material uh, access, but also it can be utilised as edge protection as well. So it could be that we look at, in this instance, it could be that we look at uh, a permanent handrail or it could be that we look at a temporary handrail in the form of scaffolding. Um, edge protection. Okay, one of the other ones that uh, I, I promised to, to, to give some update on, I haven't got a picture shown here, but with roof lights, one of the things that you um, can look to install is roof light covers. Okay, so protective um, mesh roof light covers that go over fragile roof lights um, so that if somebody was to fall on them, the mesh cover them uh, itself uh, is capable of withstanding somebody falling on it and therefore you don't go through the fragile roof light below. So that would be a, um, that would be a form of collective equipment as well in terms of potentially putting uh, a cover over that roof light. Um, they can be permanently installed or it may be that if you're working in the vicinity of a roof light, you install temporary roof light covers whilst you're working in that area. Another thing that can be done, particularly if you think you're going to need to send multiple people up there or perhaps for a longer duration, is to build something called a crash deck. So under a, under a roofing structure um, or around the edge, you can have a, a, a fall deck or a crash deck built just below the roof structure that you're working on, can provide uh, um, safe uh, collective protection in the event that anybody goes, if they fell through or off the roof, there's a, obviously a, a deck there that they would um, land on just below the roof surface. You'll see things like crash decks quite often used when people are doing re-roofing. So if they're taking off roofing, you'll quite often see um, crash decks built underneath 
um, so that when they're stripping off the old roofing um, sheet and placing new, um, there is a crash deck there. That works both for people and also for equipment, obviously, as well. And the next one uh, would be something like netting. So perhaps you'll also have seen this if people are having re-roofing done. Quite often what will be strung underneath attached to the steel structure of the building will be um, a full protection net. Uh, and that net is there so that as people are re-roofing, if they are to fall off the edge of the roof, they fall into the net and are captured from the net, are captured by the net rather than falling all the way to the ground. Obviously, that's a piece of fall arrest equipment. Um, so you will still need to consider a rescue plan, how you're going to get out of that net, how you're going to recover a potential casualty from, from in that net. But that's quite uh, a popular method where you have large scale roofing, um, re-roofing works that are being done. And what we're going to look at now is onto some of the, the personal measures. So what about if we need to access a roof and we're looking for a personal fall protection equipment? Well, we could use something such as uh, this type of device here. So this device here uh, is called a number of different things. You will hear it called a deadweight anchor, a mass friction anchor or a, or a counterweight anchor. And as you can see, um, it really relies on the, the mass of itself um, to be greater than the person, significantly greater than the person who's using it. Um, so this is a weighted device which sits on a roof, really only suitable for, for flat roofs. And it's important that it's been tested on the, the roof type in question. You can see here it's being used um, away from an edge with a piece of, with a short length of, of PPE in order to keep that person in restraint. So it's preventing, it could also be used um, depending on the roof structure for fall arrest as well. It, it is tested in fall arrest. Um, but obviously we need to be aware it has to be positioned a certain distance away from the edge of a roof um, because part of the energy absorption is that these do slide slightly along the roof when they absorb energy. So we, if we're using them in fall arrest, we obviously need to make sure that we have fall clearance, um, that we have a rescue plan and that we're using the correct PPE for going over edges. But these can be used in to prevent falls or as uh, fall arrest. We touched on these in the in other uh, webinars, so I'm not going to go into these in depth. But I mean, if we've got structure um, around us or above us at roof level, then obviously we can look to use any of the anchors that we discussed previously um, in some of the other webinars. So we could look at using a beam anchor if we've got some exposed exposed bit steel beam, or perhaps some temporary horizontal lifeline, or or some anchor slings. But all of these require some structure on which to attach to and quite often one of the problems at roof level is that you're stood on the last piece of structure which is really the roof itself so we we need to consider some other options um, available to us and so what we're going to have a quick look now at uh, we'll spend the next 10 minutes the, the last 10 minutes really looking at these permanent horizontal uh, anchors um, and systems which can provide us these access to roof areas. So we're going to be looking at sort of perhaps wall mounted as these ones are shown here or, or roof mounted full protection systems, how they can be used um, and some of the, the design considerations when using them. Um, so you can see here, you know, all of the things that we highlighted as why we would want to go on a roof or on a, a facility in the first place, we can answer all of those questions with these solutions. So permanent single point anchors, and I apologize uh, the, the, if the top of the slide is cut off there, but these are anchors which are fitted onto the roofs directly, okay, and can allow then connection of um, various PPE. It could be a, a, a lanyard, it could be a self-attracting lifeline, um, all of which, you know, that we've touched on the various versions of uh, in previous webinars. So I'm, I'm gonna focus more on the anchors here, but. These are single point anchors which can be installed into the roof. So these ones here are designed to be fitted onto concrete type roofs. Um, and you can see here, these have got bituminous uh, asphalt uh, roof finishes. They can be weathered in. 
and they provide an energy absorbing anchor. We've also got uh, these, which we're going to investigate and look at, um, which are uh, top fix anchors, which can fit onto the, the skin of the roof sheet. Uh, this uh, uh, and allow access in, in terms of a single point anchor. So perhaps if you were just doing some dedicated work, perhaps around a singular roof vent, it may well only be necessary to install a number of single point anchors if that's the only area of the roof that you need to get to. Um, so single point anchors, perfectly suitable if you need to work in just a small focused dedicated area. And now we're going to look at permanent horizontal lifeline. So what if we need to get to more of a roof area? And the first one that we're going to look at is very similar to the one that was uh, that we showed you or that it's, it's the same system, but installed in a slightly different fashion um, that was in that we showed you for the cranes and gantries. So this is uh, the eight mil horizontal lifeline system. So it can be fixed either to structure such as a wall. So perhaps if you have a plant room on a roof, we can look to fix a permanent horizontal lifeline. And here you can see the person is in restraint here with a fixed length lanyard um, that allows them to get to the edge of the roof, but not actually to fall off. Or alternatively, you can see this one here, again, a permanent horizontal lifeline system that is fixed back to the roof structure itself with posts. So we can see here, we can, we can fit rigid anchors back, these type of solid steel posts. The, the disadvantages of these are that they need to go back to structure. And particularly with metal skinned roofs, this can be a problem because you can be limited by where you can fix these posts. And if you're limited by where you can fix these posts, you're limited by where you can put the horizontal lifeline system. You can only really put it wherever there is structure existing. So it's okay for concrete roofs if we've got a flat concrete roof. Um, then we're fine with these types of, of rigid posts. But if we haven't, then we need to look for an alternative. So we'll just finish up on these. So very similar to the, uh, the, the crane mounted horizontal lifeline system. This has a, a, an eight mil cable, energy absorbing device, and then all of these various cable guides and terminations onto which a traveler is fixed. And what this allows is the user then continuous uninterrupted movement around this roof structure. And you can see here in this instance, it also is creating a sort of a demarcation zone. Inside this area, there's no fall hazards, it's safe to work. If you need to access outside of this roof area, you connect to the cable and then we're, uh, we're operating here in restraint. Okay, so this is the eight mil horizontal lifeline system. And we can connect that to various structural points to create a lifeline onto which a user can attach. Important to say, although these are designed in restraint, and I'm gonna look at this in some other slides in a bit, although this is designed in restraint, all of this is capable of taking fall arrest loads. Okay, so we, we always design for what's called foreseeable misuse. That is the chance that somebody may fall on it. So the system itself should be capable of working in fall arrest. And here we can see a, a typical layout where we can go around corners, pass through intermediates and the end terminations. And we can fix these onto either walls or structural posts fixed to the, to the structure of the building in order to create that, that horizontal lifeline layout. But what about if we haven't got structure or we don't wanna use a, a structural anchor point? Well, um, depending on the roof type, we can use this type of method, which is sort of generically known as top fix. So these are uh, a variety of ways of fixing to a roof, which is a lot less obtrusive and it allows us to fix to the top skin of the roof. So you can see here on a standing seam roof, this is clamped on a, a trapezoidal type roof. This is riveted. Uh, this is a bituminous roof and this is fitted uh, secured via toggle. So I'm going to go on to hit this slide first and you can see the various fixing methods. So huge array of fixing methods. We can either toggle fix. We do have versions to go into concrete as well. Um, so we can actually use these on a concrete roof too. We can rivet or we can clamp to standing seam roofs. Advantages of these are very minimally obtrusive. So you have a lot less water ingress, a lot less waterproofing issues. 
we can have a continuous uninterrupted roof access across all of a roof. We can go wherever the roof goes with this system. We can easily move around on this system and we can install across a wide variety of roofs, standing seam roofs, trapezoidal roofs, composite roofs, built up on site, uh, metal roofs, bituminous, PVC, wood, concrete based roofs. So really a huge variety of roofs. One other big advantage here is that as sustainability is an ever increasing topic is rather than penetrating through with a big piece of steelwork, um, anchor post, which can become a cold bridge, these sit on top of the roof, massively reduce thermal bridging. Since we're not fitting to structure, it's important that we understand how these posts work. The way that they actually work is, is inside them is this specially designed coil. We call this Spiratech technology. And in the event of a fall, in the event of these being loaded with energy, this Spiratech module actually opens up and expands absorbs a huge amount of energy, brings that energy down to a level onto which we can suitably absorb with rivets or clamps. That's how this technology allows us to fit onto the top of roofs rather than have to go back with structure. Again, series of modules, uh, end anchors, intermediate anchors, and various different guides to move that cable anywhere we want to go, over hips, over uh, through valleys, over ridges. All of this can be accommodated with the cable guides, which guide that cable um, and continuous attachment via the traveling device. And then one final one that we have is a, a rail system. Again, we have a version that can either be fitted to structure, as you can see here. So perhaps if we're looking at cleaning maybe a north light uh, or, or these, these um, windows here with a ledge and an overhang of roof. If we've got suitable structure, we can fix a rail here. Uh, this is built into the structure. And this is a version of rail which is actually able to be fitted onto standing seam or, or riveted onto metal roofs. A particular advantage of rail systems is, unlike cable systems, they don't deflect. Um, so with cable systems, you have a, a cable deflection. So when we're talking about fall clearance, um, that can be an additional problem with, with cable flex. With, um, with these rail systems, you, you don't have uh, rail deflection like you do the cable. So they can be very advantageous to providing access solutions. Um, and also, it is possible to um, abseil or work position off these, whereas it is not possible to abseil or work position off cable system. So again, just some examples here of, uh, of the, the rail system that can be installed as well. Just one, uh, uh, there's another version there of the, um, uh, the rail system installed on a roof. Just some things I wanna to touch on finally, um, as we head into the last couple of minutes, the system, the design of these is, is very, very critical. So we can see here, if we have a sort of a, a nominally flat roof in an ideal world, we would install that system sort of two and a half meters away from the edge in what we call a perimeter system. That way we can give this person a two meter fixed length lanyard and they can access all of the roof area um, without needing to adjust their PPE. It is possible that we can install what's called a ridgeline system. So we can just put a system in the middle and then give people adjustable length PPE to go out to the edges. In this instance, one of the big concerns is that if we come right out on the edge, we have this problem with swing radius, which I'll show you in the next couple of slides. So we have to put in these anti-pendulum posts in the corner. These require much more user experience. So this is a relatively easy to use system. You can clip to it and you're tied off. This requires adjustable PPE. So although it requires less equipment, it's more cost effective, it requires a higher level user skill because you need to adjust the PPE in order to allow you to get to corners. Very, very similar here. This is a, a ridge type system with anti-pendulum posts. It requires adjustable length PPE versus a perimeter type system. Okay, so system layout has a huge bearing here. You can see here that if we put the system too close to an edge, it can be fall arrest. If we position it correctly, we can operate in full restraint. If we have 
full restraint, but we have adjustable length PPE, we can still allow ourselves to get into uh, a fall arrest scenario. So it's very, very important that the positioning of these systems is determined correctly, um, and also that the correct PPE is selected when using them. This again, this slide just highlights the difference. Here's a, here's a perimeter system with somebody on a fixed length two meter lanyard, and here's the hazard. Whereas if they're on a central system, if they go down and we put anti pendulum posts, then they can be okay. But if they come down here on a, on a long length of adjustable PPE and they fall, you can see that the pendulum effect is gonna mean that they, they risk both having interaction with their PPE and the roof edge, potentially cutting the PPE, or that they have a big swing radius that can mean they end up in contact with the ground. So again, design and layout, crucially important. And the other thing to bear in mind is that because we're on roofs, quite often that's the only tie off we can get is at foot level. So you'll recall from previous slides, we spoke about how it's always better to try and get an anchor point above our heads. When we're on a roof, often that's not possible because the only anchor point is the roof itself, which is at foot level. So if we are operating in fall arrest, we really need to consider big fall clearances, potentially sort of in excess of six meters of, of fall clearance. So it's really important to go, when I go back here, that we really look to try and design that system to operate in restraint rather than fall arrest because single story buildings really need, this is really important on single story buildings because quite often we don't have that fall clearance um, in order to operate in fall arrest. And the final thing to say is obviously, you know, we've emphasized this at the end of every um, webinar is we still need to have a rescue plan. If somebody can fall off, then we need to consider how we're going to rescue them. We are not going to be able to pull them back up over the edge of a, of a roof. So we need to have a rescue system in place that either we can take them, maybe it might be a cherry picker to, to pick them off the side of the building, or perhaps um, device to allow them to tolerate suspension for longer whilst we implement a rescue plan using a rescue equipment and device to lower them. Okay, so we've been through a huge amount. Um, there, I think we're pretty much bang on time. I appreciate everybody's time. So just as a quick recap, we've had a look at, you know, a huge array of, of buildings and facilities and roofs that, that can be present on, on steel sites. We've had a look at why roof access is required. What we need to consider about getting on the roof itself. We've had a look at the, the numerous different roof hazards, which can be, can be prevalent, what those solutions are, and then uh, a little bit of a more in-depth dive into the the solutions around permanent horizontal lifelines um, and then obviously we've we've touched on uh, on rescue as well so that wraps up the the webinar on uh, buildings facilities and roofs um, thank you very very much for your time and I guess Andrew hopefully if we maybe if we've got a couple of minutes maybe just to take some questions yeah I I think we can do that Dave thank you we have a Perfect. couple of questions that have come through so um, maybe we'll, we'll run through those for no problem. Five, 10 minutes or so. So the first one's interesting. Um, though it's rare, do you need to think about tremor and vibration in a, into account when you're working on a roof? I guess someone who's written that as in a seismically active part of the world. Yeah, a couple of scenarios I can think of. I and mean, I guess one would be um, potentially the environment that you're in. So if earthquakes are, you know, perhaps an earthquake is, um, it, you know, if you're in an earthquake zone, then yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, although obviously very difficult to predict, but certainly something to bear in mind. The other one could be, you know, if you're in a very heavy industrial building and facility, um, perhaps with mills or um, or uh, or metal work, and there can be big impacts which can vibrate the whole building. So, yeah, certainly something to bear in mind. Again, take into account the environment that you're working in, and if you think there's going to be perhaps large vibrations caused by machinery or heavy plant and equipment um, uh, then, or, you know, even explosions nearby with perhaps mining or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Take that into consideration because those could cause, uh, they could cause falls to occur. And Great is it point. Always, well, sorry. No, no, absolutely. Is it always the responsibility of the asset owner to ensure that permanent lifelines are provided? Okay, yeah. So great question. Um, 
it will depend on where you are in in the in the in the world so it isn't always the responsibility i mean what we're seeing with a lot of new buildings now so what we're seeing with a lot of new builds is they are being built into the design of the building when they're built so if there's a requirement to access roofs for maintenance for example a lot of countries are including within the design regulations that some safe facility is built into that so it could be handrail it could be a parapet or it could be the inclusion of horizontal lifelines if you've got an older structure and you need to access the roof it is still required you are still required to make sure that safe access is provided so if you're using your own teams your own uh, maintenance team you are required to provide safe access that could be in the form of handrail it could be in the form of scaffold or it could be in the form of a horizontal lifeline or alternatively if you are uh, perhaps you're bringing in a subcontractor it will still they would be they could be responsible for, for providing it but you would be responsible for making sure that they had those provisions in place so they may need to install their own full protection but you would be required to make sure that they have it so it's not a legal necessity per se to install horizontal lifelines they are just one solution that can provide um, permanent access uh, for people to get on roofs and, and carry out roof maintenance but it is your responsibility to provide safe access and regarding the permanent life line the, sorry the permanent mm -hmm. horizontal life line. how many folks can use it at one time is that yeah sure so um it, it depends yeah um and and that's part of um the testing protocol of the uh, of the system itself so um the systems that we have are tested for four users so you can sp you can send four people up to use uh the, the permanent horizontal lifelines that that we have and the way that we test those is is we test them for uh, the possibility that all four users effectively fall what's called simultaneously. So that, that's effectively one follows the next, follows the next, follows the next. So all four users could fall at the same time. Mm -hmm. There are, uh, I'm aware that some people may offer more. I'm aware that some people may offer less. Generally, my personal opinion is that once you get beyond four people being on a roof, really probably having four people on a horizontal lifeline would be quite confusing because it's very difficult to cross over uh, and cross paths. So if you're looking at numerous people being on roofs, you should probably be erring more towards collective protection in the form of handrails rather than horizontal lifelines. I would say personal fall protection equipment such as horizontal lifelines is, is more prevalent to sort of up to four users is, is our take on on that. Okay, and well, maybe one one final question regarding yeah, the sure. roof safe system. Um, how do you ensure that it works on the different types of roofs available and do folks, companies install it themselves? Okay, yeah, brilliant. So uh, excellent question. So one of the things that we do with the roof safe system is there are two tests that we subject that to. One is what's called a product test, and that is a, a, a test that's defined. Um, um, there's a there's European, there, there's um, ANSI, uh, there's American or North American tests. Um, there's tests for Australia, etc. So tests all around the globe that test the product. And then what we uh, it do in addition to that is we test those systems on various different roof substrates. So we have a uh, a big database uh, of test data where we build a representative roof sample. We put that post on that roof sample and then we do drop tests on that. So we know that it works on various different uh, metal roofs, on composite roofs, concrete, timber, bituminous. So we have a whole suite of test data um, that means that when they are installed, on site, we know how it will perform on a particular roof substrate. And in terms of who can install these products, these are actually a, a product that we sell through an approved installer network. So this is not a product that you can purchase yourself off the shelf through a distributor. We actually, uh, these are sold through an approved installer network. And that is the main reason for that is it is absolutely critical that how that product is installed onto the structure 
is key to how it works. You have to know that the structure is strong enough, um, that the design has been thought out, um, that the spacing of the posts is correct, that the number of rivets, et cetera, is all done um, properly. So the roof safe, the eight mil and the rail systems are sold through an approved installer network um, who can make sure that all of the various boxes are ticked in terms of that installation. They then hand that over and you then have a safe system that can be used. And they also, those same people are able to then maintain and inspect that um, as is required. It's typically a 12 monthly inspection for those types of products. Thank there you. And that's probably no a good time to, to roll things up and um, come to the end of our presentation. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for the no engagement problem. from all of our um, participants. The recording, has, the recording of the webinar has been made. And this will be made available through the Steel University website where you can find all of the other um, recordings of the other presentations and webinars that we've done with 3M on this topic through the year. There will be another webinar coming up. Please, um, when you signed up, hopefully you signed up for updates. So you hear about that. We'll also talk about that on our social media and our newsletters. So uh, thank you all for your attention. And um, I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.